Hello everyone, Mike Levin here. It is Friday, May 5th at around 9 a.m. on my 20 minute or so walk into work. And I thought I would upset some contrary wisdom that you can't learn programming and how to program just from podcasting or audio. Well, of course, I'm actually using video and if I had a screencast and uh, I could actually type stuff and show it to you as I went, but I'm going to take an attempt at doing it just this way. Um, the chalkboard, the whiteboard for writing is inside your head, so draw this as I describe it. Instead of teaching you Python, I'm going to teach you three data objects. And already it's like, oh, objects and data. Well, just picture a set of square brackets. Inside those square brackets, put a sequence of numbers, one comma, two comma, three. That's a list. If you set a variable name equal to square bracket open, one comma, two comma, three, close square bracket, you can then say for item in variable name, it's arbitrary words we're using here, you could say for list in collection or you could say, you know, if you, if you set that list equal to the word um, collection, which already brings up issues because there is a library called collections and you want to avoid name, collection, name collisions, but what you're really doing when you're stepping through a sequence is you are stepping through item, uh, items in a collection. So if you have collection equal to square bracket, one comma, two comma, three, close square bracket, and you say for item in collection, colon, and on the next line indent, a uh, couple of spaces, four is the traditional amount, and say print, open parenthesis, item, close parenthesis. When you execute that code, it will step through each item in the list. So now you know what a Python list is. Lists are sequences of things like numbers or strings, but it could be other variable names or even function names, it doesn't matter enclosed in square brackets. There is also a um, command or keyword uh, or object in Python called list, L-I-S-T. So you could just as well say collection equals list open parenthesis, one comma, two comma, three, close parenthesis. That's using the proper object API to create and manipulate lists, but Python creates this shorthand syntax with the square brackets. Now, lists are very dynamic in nature. You can add items to the list. You can effectively insert in the middle. Uh, you can have what an item in a list points to change into something else underneath of it. So items or lists can seem to carry around very large collections of binary blobs and other things you would think too large to treat as a list. Uh, again, this is all accomplished through the magic of uh, the Python, uh, I guess, data design, data model design. So lists are fundamental in Python. It's a source of its, a lot of its dynamicism, but it also is a source of a lot of its slowness. So an alternative to lists is tuples, which instead of square brackets around it, have parentheses around it, but in otherwise, uh, but otherwise look pretty indistinguishable from lists. Open parenthesis, number, comma, number, comma, number, close parenthesis. The difference is now having created that, you can't, say append on to the end of it. A tuple is a indivisible, immutable little blobule of stuff. And when you do your work with tuples instead of lists where you can, the code will actually execute much faster. And tuples are very interesting in that because they're immutable, they can be used as unique identifiers. So you can have a tuple that has 
two positions in it say uh, date stamp and site name. And that is an immutable unit, so that can be used as a unique value where unique values are required, which happens to be in the third data object you need to know about. So far I talked about lists that use square brackets, whose object name is L-I-S-T, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. I also talked about tuples, which use parentheses around them, and its object name is T-U-P-L-E, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. So you could create tuples by saying variable name equals something in parentheses with the parentheses by themselves, or you could put the word before the parenthesis, the word tuple before the parenthesis, and it would accomplish the same thing. Just a unique little thing about uh, Python in that naked parentheses happen to be the same thing as using the word tuple before it when you're setting a variable equal to it. So anyway, you've learned list tuples, now it's dictionaries. Its object name is dict, D-I-C-T, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. And uh, these are key value pairs, where unique values are in fact name needed for the first position uh, of each key. Uh, these are often called hash tables, and they're much like what all the scuttlebutt is out there about NoSQL databases, databases that are essentially based on key value pairs uh, rather than uh, relational tables, as in SQL. And they've been around forever and they're regain regaining some popularity uh, because of things like MongoDB. And the pair in the name value pair can be anything. It can be a large uh, video uh, intended to be streamed. So uh, these sort of object databases or NoSQL databases are really good for uh, multimedia streaming systems. A lot of modern internet services really benefit by this kind of philosophical approach to managing data. But that's all this stuff really is, is philosophical approaches to managing data. Because under Python, key value dictionaries and hashtags are just a you know primary first class data object that's always there and they use curly brackets so when you want to create a dictionary you can say variable name equals dict open parenthesis um, and then use the uh, syntax for creating name value pairs inside of that or you can say variable name equals open curly bracket and then a series of something colon something separated by commas. It's finally time to tell you that when, you do, when you're using strings, when you're using a series of characters, alphanumeric strings, to use words, you have to use either single quotes or double quotes around it. So key value pairs very often look like uh, JSON. It looks almost identical to JSON, the Python dictionary object is what most people know as JSON, with only just a few little differences that happen uh, between uh, encoding and decoding these things into memory, but so little that they can be uh, transformed between each other, making Python and JavaScript like two peas in a pod uh, with interoperable communication and such. So JSON has even been expanded, I believe, to support the square bracket list notation of Python because it's used so much and maybe even tuples, I'm not sure. But uh, the thing I want to get to now is that, uh, well first I got to finish the dictionary description because a dictionary is a series of key value pairs. Uh, so it can be, you know, date stamp, colon, you know, amount of money we made that day new date stamp call in another amount of money for a different day. And so you could do time series projections or anything. But sometimes you've got situations, and this is jumping right into advanced Python. You might go, what good is a tuple? Well, you can't use a list as a key in a key value pair. But what if you want your keys in a dictionary to be unique based on more than one constraint, 
timestamp plus something else. Well, you put that timestamp value inside a tuple as, say, the first item in the tuple, and then you put something else, say, the website, as the second value in the tuple. So it's a two-value tuple surrounded by the uh, parentheses when represented uh, as a Python string. And uh, you can use that as the key in a Python dictionary. So you can use tuples. In this case, I'm talking about a two-value tuple, but it could be an arbitrary number of tuples to achieve much the same thing as compound column unique constraints or primary keys in a SQL database. So many people out there have really come to their technical savvy through this very particular path. They had to do something and they asked marketing people for some queries. The mark, uh, they had to do, the marketing people had to do something, they asked technical people to do some queries. The technical people did the queries and sometimes even include the query back to the marketing person to try and show them how simple this stuff all is. SQL would not be as popular as it is if it were not simple. It shares a lot in common with HTML in that regard. Um, it's expressive and I think, uh, let's see, imperative. I think it's called imperative. Here's what I need to get done, but I don't care how you do it. So you don't have to know about how to optimize your query. Uh, a lot of internal things that is a lot like a compile engine will kick in and do what's called execution plan analysis and retention. So it not only figures out the fastest way to do a thing, but it saves that pattern uh, as a compiled pattern in memory with a lookup table. So if it encounters a problem with very similar inputs, uh, a similar query, it will use the execution plan it already retains. So, um, there's a lot of things to love about SQL, and then one giant thing to not love, and that is it requires being set up, and you need access to it, and there's permissions, and, uh, and whatnot. There's uh, a lot involved in getting SQL to run, and then to have a query client, something where you run and execute SQL against it that's unified across the industry. In the Microsoft world, you use one thing. In the Java world, you use another. And uh, it's an unending mess getting everything working technically when you're doing SQL stuff.